You push the button yet? Yeah, I'm I'm pushed. We live now. Have a, oh, okay, all right. Man, you got to warn me, man, for I could have said something. Peace <laughs> to the chat, everybody tuned in, man. Yeah. I'm gonna say uh <clears throat> ATM hotel. Do I do I ooh? Do I aku? Do I nature? Um Fatmo Lafayette, Fatmo Iwa Pele, a goom or juve iba e, a goom goom, kiki. Oh, you got to turn your YouTube. <laughs> yeah, a goom goom, uh, kiki. I mean, uh, yeah, a goom goom, kiki, a goom goom. Um, appreciate everyone for tuning in today. Uh, we're gonna, uh, gonna walk y'all through the Omo Valley. And walk y'all through the most art artistic uh, uh, group in the Omo Valley. Give me one second, y'all. Share my screen. Oh, <laughs> 
All right. Uh, peace, peace, peace again to the family. Uh, today's presentation is called Welcome to the Omo Valley with the Cairo people by myself, Kofi Pasa. All right. One more thing. You, you know, you know, we are. This is our uh, Master Word Clan chant. Uh, we are at war with our heritage. We are at war with our culture. We are at war with our tradition. So let's go to war. Let's go to war. All right, everybody that follow me know this is my uh, saying, my phrase. As I learn, we all learn. I believe is if we uh, continue to learn information, if we continue to pass down the correct information to our families, our communities, our neighbors, I think we'll be able to uh, exceed or excel. All right, this is a disclaimer. I always have to put a disclaimer out here before I get started. My disclaimer is I am not a teacher but merely a student sharing information. And that information provided is for the educational purpose only. And if you are in doubt, do the research or have it verified by someone qualified. I reserve the right to change the focus of this presentation to shut down, excel, or exchange the terms or use at my own discretion. All trademark, design rights, copyrights, registers, names, models, logos, avatars, or sigmas and marks used or cited by this website, excuse me, or the properties of their respective owners. I reserve the right to add information as it comes available or adapt changes, improve information as it comes available in the future. Inputs wanted, changes, addition, deletions are encouraged. I'm gonna read that last statement again. I just reiterate, I reserve the right to add information as it comes available or adapt changes, improve information as it comes available in the future. Inputs wanted, changes, addition, deletions are encouraged. So I'm letting you know right there, I don't mind changing information if I, I if I am error, in error on anything or if there are some uh, updated information that I may need to update my presentations or information that I disseminate. Uh, I don't have a problem with changes. I don't have a problem with critique. I don't have a problem with people's input. All right. This is African was the center of human history that shapes the human life. And although there have been many discoveries on the continent. It is clear, 
it is clear our history goes beyond the Bible and African looking to find himself should first start with Africa. This is by the real black atheist, Unc West, my Masi warrior, uh, Ara Kuwini. All right, before I get started, uh, we're gonna walk you through some uh, fossil records. Fossil records in Ethiopia, because we're talking about the Omo, real, Omo, Omo Valley. So I wanna walk y'all through the Omo Valley and walk y'all through the Cairo people, but let's first start with some of the fossil records before we go into uh, more into the Omo Valley. 4.4 million years, hold on. All right, 4.4 million years ago, the uh, Otho, and I may be pronouncing it wrong, the Orthopithecus uh, uh, Remedius discovered in the Milo Valley of the Ashwaj Valley in Ethiopia between 1992 and 1993, nicknamed Aridi, who was believed uh, three feet, 11 inches. The Remedius has a small brain, pidel, and is believed to have lived in the wooded forest terrain. 4.2 to 3.9 million, million years, the Arthropithecus omnidius discovered in Kenya uh, and Ethiopia in 1964 with over 100 fossils totaling 20 individuals. The fossils include teeth that resembles primitive animals and the skulls that have human features. 3.9 million years, Arthropithecus afarinus discovered the Adar regions of Ethiopia in 1964. The Afarnis is on of the most famous fossil records in history known as Lucy. She had human-like hands and teeth with a strong, short physical stature and was believed to be bipedal. Lucy is also uh, the Nikash, meaning you are marvelous in Ethiopia. 2.5 million Arthropithecus Karhi Bye, son. Love you, too. Discovered in Buru, Ethiopia in 1999, 1998, the bipedal orthopedicus had large, real teeth, a primitive skull, lived mostly off the plant-based diet and possibly some meat. 2.6 to 2.3 million years, Arthropithecus orthopedicus, and I know I'm pronouncing it wrong, discovered, the Ethio discovered in Ethiopia in 1967, appeared to be com a combination of primitive and modern traits. 195,000 years ago to present, Homo sapiens sapiens, or modern human, what we are, originated from the Omo Valley in Africa. Modern man is, is the last surviving species in the Homo genius uh, family. Modern man is believed to be the most invasive species in the history of the planet. So I want to rock y'all through some of the fossil records in Ethiopia because we're talking about the Homo Valley. So we know that the Homo sapiens sapiens goes back 195,000 years, what we are. So in the, in the, uh, those uh, fossils was found in the Omo River Valley. All right. Two Ethiopian fossils has been crowned as the oldest known members of our species. It's estimated 195,000 years old. The pair was witness to the earliest days of the Homo sapiens. The discoveries add yet more weight to the argument that Africans and the Ethiopians in particular was a birthplace of humans. The dating sits well with genetics analysts and modern population, which suggests that the H uh, the Homo sapien first appeared in around 200,000 years ago. The fossils called Omo 1 and Omo 2 were found in 1967 at Kabish, near Ethiopia's Omo River by the famed fossil hunters Richard Leakey. Although Leakey realized that the Omo 1, at least with the Homo sapien, the dating of the mollusk shells found with the bones suggests that the species, specimens were only 130,000 years old. So in the beginning, when they first started out, they, they, they dated it back to uh, uh, the Homo sapiens sapiens to 130,000 years old, excuse me. And in 1697, dating, dating techniques weren't what they were now. So saying uh, John Fingles of Stonebrook University, New York, who took part in the latest analyst published 
Uh, in Nature One, the besides Leaky and his colleagues were more concerned with hunting from something millions of years older. The fact of the matter is that they they were early hominids. Modern humans were limp like chimp. Ch I mean, were like chump. I mean, chumps or uh, chimps. That's what I spoke up and changed. Fedulin says, as a result, nobody attempted to date the fossil burial sites more accurately, despite its significance in helping to settle debates over humanity, African roots. When the modern human or, or, or origin became a big issue in the early 1980s, Ethiopia was closed, Flag says. Scientists led to Frank Brown Dean in the University of Utah College of Mines and Earth Science and Geological Ian McDougall at the Australian National University of Kibera, Australia, dated the skull by analysts by mineral crystals in the volcano ash layers above the below siltstone sediments that contain the two sets of bones. They determined that the age by examining the rate of the decay and unstable isotopes of the elements Aragon in the rocks. This really does make it clear that the atomically modern Homo sapiens goes back a couple of hundred thousand years at least, says uh, Bernard Wood, the anthropologist at George Washington University. So the two uh, Leakey found uh, and dated the Homo sapiens sapien 100 and, 130,000 years. And then later on, I think in 1987 or something like that, uh, when they, became, they uh, the dating process developed more and they came up with uh, other things, it went back further to 195,000 years. So the first Homo sapiens sapien originated in the Omo River Valley uh, 195,000 years ago. All right. I just want to again walk y'all through the fossil records in Ethiopia from the hominid stage to the Homo stage. So now I want to welcome you all to the Omo Valley. Omo Valley is undoubtedly one of the most unique places on earth because of the wide variety of people and animals that inhabit it. It is located in Africa, Great Rift Valley. The region is known for its culture and diversity. The tribe that lives in the lower Omo Valley are believed to be among the most fascinating on the continent, on Africa and around the world. Tools of offering to several towns and villages. It is often you come, it is often you come into contact with the following tribe, the Aboro, the Ara, the Bini, the Bodo, the Buma, the Dasanisi, uh, which is the Gilibi, the Dorso, the Homo, or the Hamar, Kara, 
or Koro, which is the tribe we're going to be talking about, the Konso, the Kiji, or the uh, Muji, the Mercy, the Tanesme, and the Turkana uh, when you tour to the tour to the uh, to the valley or the Omo Valley. So these are a lot of the tribes that lives in the Omo Valley. The Omo River runs through the valley and impetus into the Lake Tur uh, Turkana. The river is an important resource, and without it, it tribes and animals in southern Ethiopia would not survive. In 2006, work began on the Gi 3 Dam. The dam will block part of the Omo River, which expert states will impact the ecosystem, tribes, and animals that live in the valley. After the earliest known discoveries of the Homo sapien humans, fossil fragments were found. The lower Omo Valley and the Lake Turkana, which is primarily located in Kenya, have both been declared World Heritage Sites by the U United uh, Nations Edu Educational Scientists and Cultural Organization or the UNESCO. And I advise everyone to get all the volumes of the UNESCO uh, books. The figure of these tribes lies in the balance of a massive hydroelectronic dam. Gib 3 has now been built on the Omo River in order to support a vast commercial plantation that are forcing the tribes from their land. Cellini, uh, I don't even know what that word is. It's an Italian word. An Italian company started constructing work on the dam at the end of 2006, and it is now complete. The government is now planning to build the Guild 4 and Guild 5. It will destroy the fragment environment and the livelihood of the tribes, which also uh, closely links to the river and its annual flood. Hold on, let's skip. After caring about a plenary elevation to studies, both of the European investment banks and the African development banks announced in 2010 that they were no longer considered funding the GIF-3. However, China largely bank and the industrial commercial banks of China agreed to fund part of the construction of the dam. And now I'm talking about the dam before we get into the Cardinal people. Uh, this dam that's in the Omo, this dam that they have built in the Omo Valley that they started constructing in 2016 is a major part of the tribe's survival um, uh, in the Omo, uh, in Ethiopia. And they have started building a dam. One uh, group pulled out of it. You had the Italians over there. Now you got the Chinamen and you got a few other farmers that's over there uh, setting up these different. Uh, Plantation, so they're building this dam over here, and this dam, this hydraulic dam that is converting water to these uh, uh, plantations that they have um, over there, the businesses that they have over there, agreed to fund parts of the construction of the dam, and the World Bank is funding power transmission lines from the dam. Hundreds of kilometers of irrigation canals are diverting the life-giving waters to the plantation. Survival in various re regions of the international organization, as well as hydrologics and other researchers, believe that the Gib 3 Dam and the plantations will have catastrophic consequences for the tribes of the Omo River Valley. And they also interviewed the Mercy people that is also a tribe over there in Omo River, and they are suffering, suffering tremendous because they do a lot of their fishing and so forth from that river, but a lot of the water is being diverted. Uh, um, to that dam who already live close to the margins off of this dry and challenging area. In 2011, the government begins to lease out a vast block of fertility land in the lower Omo regions of Malaysia, Italians, Indians, and the Korean companies to plant biofuel and cash crops. So you have the Malaysians, the, Ind the Italians, the Indians, the Koreans, as well as the Chinamen companies that are, that are in Omo, in the Omo River, I mean, in the Omo Valley now. A cash crop such as all plains, uh, jatrophos, cottons, and maize. It has started to affect body, the Kuwu, the Mercy people from the land into resettling areas to make way for the largest state runs, Kora sugar project covering 150,000 hectares, but which could eventually cover 240,000 hectares. I mean, the Sura who live west of the Omo are also being forcible resettled to make way for a large commercial plantation. 
the body, the mercy, and the surah have been told they have to give up their herds and cattle and vital parts of their livelihood and may only keep a few cows in the resettlement where they will become dependent on the government aid for to survival. Services and food aids and resettlement camps are often non-existent and poor quality. All right. The Nkaro, also known as the Kara, are a small tribe with an estimated population of a 1,000 to 3,000. They are closely related to the Kiwi tribe. They live along the east bank of the Omo River in southern Ethiopia. The Koro tribe have three villages, the Korcho, the Dusk, and the Lupa. The Lupa. They are surrounded by a relative wealth and strong groups in terms of cattle population size. The Koro, whose neighboring, especially the, the Hamhara to the southeast, Bana to the east, Bashada to the uh, 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 to the east, the Mercy to the north, the Niya, the Niyagantun to the west across from the Omo River. Known them by the name Kara, speak a South Ometic language. The main substance crops of the Koro are the sorghum, the maize, and the beans. They are also supplemented by beekeeping and more recently fishing. They plant fields using rain, flood. They plant fields using rain, floods, retreat, and riverbank cultivation. And that's why I talked about the Gib Dam, because they their their survival, these tribes' survival of the Omo Dam is 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 is, is I mean, that is that is that is uh their main focus. They 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 cultivate uh riverbank. The riverbanks, but the most important sources of the grain produced the riverbank form that the other two reach the care uh, carry out both along the Omo River and the shores of Lake Demba. Many of the traditional rituals might have originated where another much larger tribe, the Hemhara, which is of the same lineage but number approximately 30,000. These two groups speak nearly identical Omitic language and much of the sim symbolism found in the groups. Ceremonies suggest a rich cultural history together. The Amhara and the Karo traditions are very similar. You will see as I get further in the presentations that the, uh, the Amhara uh, traditions are mirroring the same as the Koro uh, traditions. All right, the Koro people, themselves from many, the Koro people differentiate themselves from many of the neighboring tribes by excelling specific in the bodies and face paintings. They paint themselves daily with color orchards, white chalk, yellow mineral rocks, charcoal, and pulverizing iron ore or natural resources located in the area. The specific design drawn on their bodies can change daily and very, very in context, ranging from simply starting of a lines of the animal motif. You can see here uh, these two Karo uh, young men here with the uh, chalk uh, on and the different designs on uh, lines on their body. We're going to get into more designs. We're going to get into more pictures. Uh, and, and I'm trying to demonstrate why I say they are the most artistic tribe in the Omo River, in the Omo Valley. Motifs such as the Guana Fowl, which you can see this sister here. The Guana Fowl, the plumage are the most popular. The mirrors of the hand printing covering the torso and the legs. Both the Kara, the Nkara, and the Hemhara men use clay to construct elaborate hairstyles and headdresses for themselves, significant status, beauty, and bravery. Here is another picture of a Karo brother uh, here. And another Karo brother here, they talk about the different designs back with the different lines, the motif of the uh, of the guana file, the, the uh, a plumage, uh, the hand printing. So here are some pictures of the hand prints. And we'll talk uh, a little bit later in the presentation about why that they put these different hand prints uh, on the body and on the face. The Karo male hairstyle is very elaborate. A part is made from one ear to the other. The front portion is made into braids, which frames the forehead. The rest of the hair is drawn back into a thick 
Chigno, or uh, held firmly by a colorful cap of glazed earth, sometimes piece of piece of bark are glued into the cap and holes the and holes holes are made in the bark to attach ostrich feathers, or it is painted in red, white, and black, three colors of mystical and legendary significance. A man wearing a gray and red archer clay hair bun with an ostrich feather indicates that he has bravely killed an enemy from another tribe or a dangerous animal, such as a lion or a leopard. This is a clay hair bun often take up to three days to construct. It is usually remade every three to six months and can be worn from a period of one year after the kill. So you can see here this elder, this brother here with a feather. And again, we wore feathers in Africa. I know when we see black men with feathers on, we think of the abos, we think of the Native Americans. But we wore we wore feathers uh, in our motherland. Uh, so here, if you see a brother in the Cairo or in the Omo Valley that has a feather, which you if you see a black, a white, or red ostrich, it's, in, it's, it's actually indicating that he has made a kill to one of uh, one of their uh, one of their enemies, or they have killed a dangerous uh, animal uh, near the tribe. Here are a few other pictures of our brothers in the Caro uh, uh, Caro tribe that has feathers uh, on their heads. You can see this brother here, and here is the helmet that they was talking about. They was made out of a certain bark. That they that they glued together with the feathers here. This is a, a better picture. Here is another one. Here is another one. Large bees worn around the neck of a man also signifies a big game kill. The Caro men covers their body and faces with ash mixed with fat, as symbolizes brutality. They want that energy for important festivals and their ritual comebacks between the clans which takes place after the harvest. Cylinders also proteins them from the uh, 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 mosquitoes and the testy flies. So they wear this certain thing that they call cylinder that they made to protect their skin from these testy flies, which, uh, um, and the mosquitoes. The mosquitoes are very bad. Uh, um, there and those testy flies that are there that has, uh, um, basically killed off a lot of their stock. They were very rich in cattle. And due to the test these flies, their cattle has slimmed down very slim due to these test these flies. These ceremonies comebacks are a great importance because they enable the men to exhibit, exhibit their beauty and courage and thus perhaps attract a woman. The scars are lacerations, particularly those on the chest of a highly esteemed marks of value. So you can see here that the brother, then they they are masters in maize. This is one of their cast crop maize. So you see a brother here. He has a crown here of maize on top of his head. He's as his painted his face painted with the white chalk. He has quarry shells. He doesn't have crystals around his neck. He has quarry shells. He has beads around his neck. So I know a lot of us get the, our African culture mixed up with the Hindu or the Indian culture where we talk about the crystals and we talk about the stones. But in African culture, we didn't wear crystals. So and throughout my presentation, as well as the Masi presentations, we keep reiterating that we wore quarry shells. Everything that we had had quarry shells on it. We wore beads, <laughs> no crystals, no stones. Here is some of the markings of they talking about values of uh, the coral people marking their chest with different lacerations. So here is a brother here. I hope y'all can see these lashes on and these lashes, these marks, these straight marks across the chest represents either a kill of an animal or a kill of a enemy of the coral people. So I wanted to show kind of blow it up where I can kind of show. Uh, what they was talking about in the previous side, uh, uh, those uh, lacerations or lines or slashes on the chest of the men that represents value or representing one who has also, you see, as I said earlier, as you see a brother with those crown with the feathers on can also 
means that he has killed a uh, a, uh, a a a animal that was uh, may harm the tribe, or they may have killed a a uh, a enemy of the Cordero people. The same here when you see those different lines. If y'all, I hope y'all can see these different lines, these different lacerations across the chest of this Cordero brother here. All right. Cordero women usually wear only a skin lion cloth decorated with beads, not crystals, not stones, and quarries. You can see here in this demonstrate in, in this picture here, you can see these beautiful Cordero sisters here with the lion cloth skin on here. And you can see the designs of the Cordero shells going down and they have their beautiful uh chalk mask uh, on with the different dots. As we said earlier, that the different designs of the artists that did the painting, they use all kind of different designs to paint the face, the bodies, the legs, and so forth. There are hair, agreed, their hair is greased with red clay and cut into a short skull cap. And you can see here, this is what it's talking about. A lot of the women has these short cut skull caps and I'll show a, a, a little bit better picture here in a minute and grease with red clay. That's why the sister hair is cl uh, in red clay. And if you look at some of the Hemhara people that also live in the Omo Valley, they have these long like dread, uh, dreadlocks of uh, bees and they also grease their uh, scaps with this red clay. That's why they hair look uh, reddish as well. The Cardo, the Cardo existing practice in their daily lives are for self pleasure and pride respect and symbolic recognition within their societies. And as a means of attraction, the opposite sex doing the rituals. Courtship dances are frequently held and oftentimes the outcome of these frenzies in passion dances result in a future marriage. And we'll talk a little bit about that uh, in the presentation. All right, here is another picture of they we were talking about those sisters with those lion, with those uh, 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 skin, skin lion cloth uh, on here. You can see this elder woman here with the uh, skin lion cloth on with the quarry, she quarry shells and the beads uh, on the neck. You can see this beautiful sister here with the same thing, this skin loin cloth and the designs of the quarry shields going down the side and she has uh, the beads and so forth on and we'll talk about that in her chin in a minute. Here are where I talked about when I talked about those bold cuts of the women and their hair being greased with the red clay. I mean, red clay. You can see here uh, the elder is greasing uh, the young sister hair with the red clay. She also has the bold cut. And you can see here this young sister is helping out another young Cordero sister here with the bold cut. And she is greasing her hair with the red clay. Specific rituals, rituals occur. Specific rituals occur regularly within the tribal communities, and sometimes neighboring villages will travel all night to uh, to witness these rites of passages and participate in a celebration. Body scarification conveys either significance, symbolism, or artistic beauty. So scarification can also represent artistic beauty, which we I have talked about on numerous occasions in a lot of my presentation about scarification. They are also represented as beauty marks. Scarification uh, of the man's chest indicates that he has killed enemies from other tribes. And this is specifically dealing with the Koro tribe. And I showed you uh, the brother a while ago with the laceration, the lines on his on, on his chest, those scars on his chest. Uh, and he, he is highly respected within the community. He, each line of his chest represents one killing. A complete chest scarification is not rare. I'm going to go back before I finish reading to show you. Then, these lacerations or these lines on this brother's chest symbolize a kill. It may have been a wild animal to protect the Koro tribe, or it may be an enemy of the tribe. And this brother here is a well respected. Uh, 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 man in his uh, in his tribe or his clan or his community or his nation. The Cardo women are considered particularly sensual 
and attract if if cuts are made deep into the chest and torsos and ash is rubbed in creating a raised effect over time and thereby enhancing sexual beauty so you can see here this sister here where they rub this certain type of ash in um to make a certain effect uh to the scarification which i guess would rise those scarification uh marks here and then you can see here this sister here she has a bunch of scarification on her stomach or torso uh area here and it is only to enhance they say to enhance their beauty or attract the opposite sex this is nothing new in african culture once a caro girl has received the last of her scars she allows to marry and have children the complete scarification of a man's chest indicate that he has killed an enemy or a dangerous animal as i keep reiterating the scars are cut with a knife or razor blade and ash is rubbed in to produce a raise effect which i showed you the raise effect right here with this sister here at the top some of them use that ash and it begins to raise the scarification on the uh stomach or the torso area and here you can see uh this pregnant uh caro woman with the beautiful bees on and she has the scarification marks these she has the different lines as the brother had on his chest that i showed you here is another sister here with the scarification marks on her stomach as well The Caro people decorated their faces with bodies and celebrated important festivals. Hold on, let me find my curse. The Caro people decorated their faces and bodies to celebrate important festivals and for purely artistic reasons. They also do piercing and self-inflicting scars as a means of enhancing their beauty. So they not only do scarification for to enhance their beauty or attract the opposite sex they also use uh piercing face piercing so you will see a lot of the coro women with these piercings in the face you can see here this sister she has a pierce in the face this sister here this beautiful sister here this beautiful sister here they are these are also to enhance their beauty these piercing i have a few more here is a young sister here with a piercing this sister here here this young sister here you even have the men that also pierce their face as well so you have you have an elder here with a young child he has a pierce uh in the face you have a young brother here who is getting paint getting his chalk uh paint and designs on his face with his beautiful bees and he also has a pierce in here and it's not only to enhance the women but but also enhance the, the men. The Caro women are, are no, the Caro women are known for their productive work and dedication to serve their families. From sunrise to sundown, they travel on foot to their working place, the surrounding bush and fields of the Caro tribe. They do this every day of their lives to keep their family health and alive, health and alive while the men of the indigenous group protect the village and people from wild animals hunt crocodiles and other predators or simply just just sit under and hunt and chew tobacco the kala the kalash nikos which is a ak-47 you will see a lot of the caro people are the Karo men or the Karo warriors with these AK 47s that they are now trading things to get out of the Sudan because we know that Sudan has been in continuous attack and and has numerous has been going on and still going on of numerous wars in the Sudan. So now the Karo people have uh started trading certain things from the Omo uh valley to get these AK 47s and these go ahead i got a quick question sorry go to ahead. cut your bill um are the ak-47s also associated with some type of uh 
uh, rites of passage or as far as a manhood or a protector in another community of the tribe? Uh, yes, they just now started to try to reiterate this because, I mean, this is something new in the beginning. No, they didn't have the AK-47, but now uh, it has become uh, some form of their rites of passage, again, in order to pr protect uh, the tribe. To protect the tribe and protect the uh protect the family because when they off on their rights of passages we know that they are being taught certain things and one of the uh their uh thing the, the rights of passage dealing with the manhood is to protect the women and protect the tribes so uh i hope that answer your question is that answer your question seeing to you all right uh, it is a symbol. It is a status symbol, but also it is necessary to protect both the herds and themselves, as I reiterated, because in their rites of passages, they are taught to protect their tribes and their women by all costs. At regular intervals, the Karo tribe is in conflict with the neighboring, and one of their neighboring uh, that they in, in continuous conflict with is uh, the Mercer tribe. The Mercer tribe, which uh, this Omo Valley is, I'm going to do uh, uh, a lot of presentations dealing with the tribes that's in the Omo Valley. So we'll touch on the Mercer and we'll touch on the Inya Katomo uh, tribe, which is also uh, in conflict with the uh, Karo people, especially, I have it here, especially the Niya, Niya Kanto tribe on the other side of the river. In the Omo Valley, it has been easy to get a Kal Kalash Nikovs because of the close proximity to Sudan and this warship there, as I talked about earlier. Here are some of the pictures of the Koro warriors here. You can see them with their AK 47s. You can see a lot of them. I talk about the, the feathers. You can you'll see the brothers with the with these helmet feathers of white feathers, red feathers and white red and black feathers so you see here you have this young uh, warrior here uh protecting you know what i'm saying he's he's a protector he's protecting his tribe protecting the women uh you have a bunch of these uh warriors here um doing the same thing you have these warriors here uh and they have the beaded they have the beaded headbands on no chorus no no i mean no no uh crystals and no stones on the head and I'm I'm just gonna keep reiterating that because I keep continuously seeing people associating uh, uh, crystals and stones to African culture, and I'm not saying nothing wrong with the crystals uh, and the uh, uh, the stones, but they have nothing to do with African culture. And these brothers here have the beads, and I may have a close picture up later on. Uh, a lot of the corals wearing the beads, but you can see the clay and the uh, the designs, the paint, the body designs, and the facial designs. You can see here the same with the chalk designs. They are very artistic. You can see here this brother here, and um, he has a look like a beaded uh, tie, but I think this might have been, he might have took it down and put it on over his shoulder because I think this is the headband that these brothers are wearing over here. And you can see that they paint their faces, their arms there uh and also their legs with these different designs we talk about the lines uh the horror the geometrical designs the dots uh the other different red color clays with the fillers emulating the guana file and so forth the indigenous people here have always traded with each other for beads food cattle and cloth more recently the traded has been in guns and bullets in in uh inevitable as roads are made through the areas other goods like be like beer and food find their ways into the village there are serious concerns about the impact of the gigantic dams that are currently under construction and they're cons uh and as i talked about the give give three a uh, hydro 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 electronic dam that is converting the water to these plantations that the chinaman the korean the uh the italian and the malaysian have their hand in over there in the omo river valley now and a lot of these uh they they uh 
they use they 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 use the river for their survival. They use the river for the flooding. The especially some of the Mercer people, they use it for fishing and some other different things. Uh, drink uh, drinking water, and the Coro people use it uh for when the uh Omo the Omo River floods. You know, they use it for uh, uh the flooding cultivation to uh, um for this for the silk um after the uh the Omo River has flooded. So they are in, you know, they are, 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 are those dams, that dam that they build over there is, is very detrimental to uh, those tribes in the Omo River Valley. And they are thinking about building uh, the Gilb 4 and the Gilb 5 dam over there as well. There is uh, there's serious concern about the impact of the gigantic dam that is currently under construction. It will produce much needed electricity, but at the same time, it will reduce the river flow and tang the season of the flood and retreat, which the indigenous group living downstream relies on nursing their crops. The boys have painted their body and faces with white chalk for a ceremony. This is a ceremony, a rites of passage ceremony that these young Koro brothers are going through. An important ceremony in a young man's life is a bull leaping ceremony and quali qualifies for marriage. And you can also see I spoke earlier about the Hemhara tribe that is also uh, resides in the Omo Valley. Their traditions are also similar uh, to the Koro people. So they also have a rites of passages. The Hemhara has a rites of passages where they have to jump, where these young boys have to jump over or leap over, um, leap over these uh, bulls. Uh, Bull leaping ceremonies for qualifying for marriages. After marriage, the most important ceremony is the dini to celebrate and bless his daughter's fertility and marriage. Hold on one second, y'all. Should I had a phone call? Shoot. All right. The biggest ceremony uh, in the man's life is called the dini. It is purpose is to celebrate the uh let me go back because i want to not i just wanted to you know and keep showing you these artistic designs you can see these brothers with the different uh crowns on top of the head um the uh chalk the different designs are on the face and the arms and the stomach over here the same thing you can see uh see the picture a little bit better over here the biggest ceremony of a man's life is called the Dimni. Its purpose is to celebrate and bless his daughters for fertility and future marriage. When he has gone through the Dimni, a man becomes an elder. About 10 cattle and 30 small, smaller animals are slaughtered and other stocks is traded for coffee. Men and women dressed in animal fur, cat, cats, to feast and dance and the leaders of the village Bless the girls. Hold on. What did I do? All right. Until the age of around 10 to 12, as a tease, girls are called wild animals and bo or boys. And I kind of and I agree with what they're saying because we are all animals at our when we come we have to be tame we have to be taught things we have to be taught how to walk we have to be taught how to eat we have to be taught right from wrong so we are wild animals we are untamed until we are taught these things and in the coral people in the coral tribes you are considered a wild animal until you go through these rites of passages and you become a young adult a young man and a young woman i mean a man and a woman since you cannot act like a woman, i.e., wear clothes, get married, etc. And again, and you, uh, the adult rights passage is attached to the marriage, uh, marriage right, which I talked about in my marriage, uh, in my rights of passage presentation, as well as the most important ceremony in Africa is the marriage right. But you have to be an adult first. You have to be recognized as an adult in your tribe, your clan, or your society first before you're able to get married. And 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 uh um combine families or join families together 
before they are circumcised. The bull leaping ceremony is a rites of passage to mark the boy's coming of age. Each boy naked has to make four clean runs over the back of a cow without falling. So you can see here the caudal, you can see here they are he's naked and he has to leap over these bulls without falling. The Hamhara tribe does the same thing in their boys' rites of passages. So he has to leap over these bulls and back over these bulls without falling. The Koro, like the Hamhara, performs the Bula or the Pela initiation rite, which sig signifies the coming of age from young men. The initiation must demonstrate that he is ready to become a man by leaping over rows of cattle six times, consequently without falling. If successful, the boy will become eligible for marriage as, a lo as long as his older brother are already married, and he will be allowed to appear publicly with an elder to, uh, to, uh, in, I mean, uh, to elder in a sacred area. Like the Danasna, and I'm sorry, y'all, I'm not looking at the chat, but once I get through with the presentation, if anybody got any questions, I'm going to go back through the chat. If anybody got some questions, I'll answer the questions. And if I can't get to answering all the questions before I cut the show, um, I'll go back and look at them and I'll answer your questions. But I'm trying to get through the presentation um, because um, I'm trying to, at the end, I have uh, something else special for y'all. Like the Danesna and the Badna, the Koro practice ritual dances and singing. They to preparing for a ceremony. They paint their bodies and face with white chalk mixed with yellow rock, red iron, and oil charcoal. The Koro used to have big, magnificent houses when they were rich in cattle. But after a loss of their wealth through Tesla flies, which I talked about other than Tesla flies devastated uh, the Koro tribe uh, um, 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 rich in cattle. They killed off a lot. Those flies killed off a lot of the cattle. So they don't have as much cattle as they did as before. But the but after uh, they have lost their wealth through Tesla flies, they adopted the much later conventional huts of the Buma. Every Karak family owns two houses, the colonial shape Ono, which is a principal living room of the family, and the flat roof, uh, a kappa, which is the center of several houses' whole activities. I'm just showing a couple of the Koro's uh, houses. The Koro practices ritual, ritualizes in, 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 in facade or minji, killing by putting dirt in their newborn children's mouths and leaving them to die. The Koro tribes kill infant borns out of wedlock as that is seen as a dire abomination and is in a, a parable shame to one's family. Now, you see this all throughout African culture. As I stated, over here in North America, we need to reiterate uh, those rites of passages. I'm not agreeing to what the Koro people are doing by killing the infants that are born without marriage. But it is very shamed upon in African culture. That's why we go through the rites of passage. You go through the rites of passages of the naming and the birthing. You go through the rites of passages of the adulthood. You go through the rites of passages of the circumcision. You go through the rites of passage of, of the marriage. which And you go through the rites of passages of, 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 of the elders. You go through the rites of passages of an, an ancestorship after you, uh, after you transition. Now, the marriage... Is that marriage is connected to the adult right. And through the adult right, if we have those rites of passage where we go through those adult rights, the uh when those boys and those girls are separated from society, and they are the and each, no matter what rites of passage that you find that you uh find in Africa, they are always excluded from 
uh, from excluded. I'm not saying I'm, I, I already knew one person was going to jump off the handle. I just said I did not agree. But if you understand African culture and you understand the rites of passages, a lot of this did not happen for as murdering the babies. If you study the rites of passages and it, I mean, it kind of bothers me a little bit because we go through this week after week after week of trying to get the family to understand African culture tradition. So we break down the culture and the tradition and we go through it week after week after week after week. And we still have people that are still lost and we still we, we, we're we continuing to trying to assimilate this information so you can have an understanding. So if I talked about the rites of passage, then you will understand it was a limited of this. And I'm saying that every, and, and again, everything that deals with Africa and just because I'm African center doesn't say I agree with everything. There's a lot of stuff that I don't agree with. I just said I don't agree with this. But a lot of it did not happen. And it did not happen because the the rites of passage of the adulthood is connected to the marriagehood. You had to be taught how to be a man, how to be a woman. A woman supposed to be with a man. A man is supposed to be with a uh, be with a woman. A man duty. What is a woman's a woman's duty? A woman supposed to be doing her rites of passage is supposed to stay a virgin until she get married and build relationships with other family. So you didn't have children unless you was married. And you was taught this in the rites of passage when you go through your adult righthood. Infants conceived out of wedlocks are abandoned in the isolated places. And excuse me for being frustrated, family, but I mean, we talk about this stuff. And, and I, I mean, we talk about we go over this stuff constantly and constantly. We try to beat this into your head. And that's why we say take out a pen and a piece of paper when we're doing these presentations. Because we have people constantly come back and ask the same questions. Or we have people constantly come back and comment on things um, that we already have been over that they should already know about. Infants conceived out of wedlock or abandoned in an isolated place. The child may either die out or dehydrate or uh, a hydrate high dehydration or get killed by a beast and not found in non tribes. And this was again, this was you don't see this a lot in African culture, but it was very shamed upon. I don't care what I don't care where you go. It was very shamed upon. Do I agree with what they did? No. But I'm going to put the information out there, too. I, this is nothing I wasn't going to say, OK, well, I researched this. I found this. I'm not going to add this. No, I'm going I'm to put what I researched on. At the end of the harvest uh, and at times in initiated and marriage, the Koro comes together to enjoy dances. During the moonlight dance, the Koro men leap joining one another in long lines toward the women and coming toward one by one se to select the man whom they favor. So you can see here that this is something that they do uh, to find interest in people or to find their husband or find their mass. I mean, their wives, excuse me. They would uh, do these leaping uh, dances, which I will show, but the leaping dance also represents uh, certain things that's dealing with, uh, uh, with them harvesting uh, and agriculture and so forth. But they would do these dances and join each other in a line, you know, uh, with the women. Afterward, the Cairo men and women coupled themselves performing rhythmic pulsating dances, thrusting their hips once against the other in the dusty atmosphere of the early evening, as these brothers are doing, our brothers and sisters are doing now. They are joint with the women. You know, they are showing their interest in these women. They choose their women uh, or their wives this way. Uh, in the dust atmosphere in the early evening. These dances often lead to marriage after the initiation has successfully accomplished. The Karo men may take as many wives as he can afford, but usually he marry only two or three. So they practice polygamy as well. So the man can take uh, several wives, but mostly he takes up to two to three if he can afford them. Face mask. The marking of the important part of the festivals and ceremonies within within the tribes. Y'all hold on one second. I got to take this. Hold on. 
I'm on the I'm I'm doing I'm on the Monster Warrior plan. I'm gonna call you back. Sorry. But here is just a uh picture here of the markings, uh, uh clay uh mass and markings on the body of the Cardinal. Here is a Caro family here. Uh here is a Caro chalk painting uh here. A Caro women starting to pour grain from one bowl to another over and over. This beautiful sister here, you can see the piercing, the bees, and she has uh, the scarification marks on her stomach. The Caro young uh, young women here, beautiful young sisters here, and you can see this on Facebook. <laughs> you you see this with the sisters on uh, uh, on Facebook. You see a lot of them. You know, do the little picture things, and they put the little flowers on top of the heads and the flowers on the side here. But this sister has the flower uh, into her piercing here, and you can see the beads, and then you can see the beaded collar necklace here. And the men wear again, as I showed earlier, those warriors had the beaded collar headbands on. Here is the Cairo tribe cheering, playing in the Omo River in Ethiopia, and some of the young boys uh has the bowl cuts as well as the females here is a caro uh old man here he was the caro uh tribal elder and three young boys overlooking the omo river valley in ethiopia see the beautiful designs on the brothers uh the elder and the sister you can see him has a feather one his feather is a blackish yellowish reddish color uh here and i guess uh, i might have been mistaken so this may be some type of neck beaded necktie because i showed you another of one of the brothers that had the ak-47 one of the warriors the Carl brothers one of the Carl brothers that had uh the he beaded headbands on but i said the other brother must have took his head headband off and put it over his neck but it must be some type of beaded necktie Coro, this is a Coro elder with Coro, uh, Coro elders with a Coro child here. And you can see the feathers, the, the big feather here. So again, we wove feathers in Africa. And you can see the elder has on, the elder brother and the elder sister have on the, the skin lion cloth uh, thing, uh, dress wear here with the decoration Coro shells that I showed er earlier. And you can see one of their cash crops is the maize. So you can see this elder with this crown on. I showed you a brother early, earlier. So you can see the crown maize uh, on top of this elder head. All right. Now, um, I have a brother, uh, and I want to get his name right. Hold on just a second because he changed his name. And I want to get this brother name right. And I'm almost through with the presentation. Hold on just a second. I want to make sure I get my brother name right. All right. Uh, my brother that stays in London. Uh, Sin Zanga, Sin Zanga Jekna, which he said he's going to get ready to change his name. Jekna, we talked and he went into why he was going to change uh Jekna, but it's he goes by Sin Sinzanga Jekna, and he's he, he's residing in London. And this brother has a clothing line called the Cloth of Jekna. And a lot of the artistic styles that I showed you with the Coro, it is in his clothing that he has. And he inspired, he was inspired by the Omo River Valley and some other African traditions. Uh, but specifically the Omo, the Omo Valley with the Coro people. So you can see here you have, um, you can see here he you have uh, this sister here, and you can see how he implemented a lot of the different designs. I talked about the lines, the geometrical lines, the uh, polka, the, the circles of the polka dots. He implemented the the uh, guano file with the red clay 
and so forth. So he has implemented those things into his clothing. Here is another thing, this brother, I don't know, I think this is a jacket that he made right here. You can see the Coro designs that they use to paint on their bodies, their faces. He has the shoes, he has the shirt and the pants and the headwear with those different designs that I showed you uh, dealing with the Coro people. And again, his clothing line is called the Cloth of Jekna. And I have information if you wanna reach out to the brother and get some things. Here is some boots that he did. The clo uh, uh, of his clothing line, the cloth of Jekna. And the same designs that I showed you for as the elders, as the youth, as the women, and as the men wore uh, uh, that they painted on their face, their bodies, their arms, and their legs. Here is this brother working here. I don't know, this looked like a dress or something here that he's working on that he's painting. Here is another dress. This may be the same dress that he's working on, but here's a woman uh, in the dress and the headband, and she has the painted designs of the coro on the face. Here's the shoes that he made with the same paintings that I showed you earlier uh, with the guana file, the woman with the guana file, paint, paint fading, paint faced on her, on her face, and the ostrich feather on her head. Here, the same designs of the coro. This is a tile. This is a bad jacket here. Uh, another piece by my brother here. And a shirt, I think, here. This is my brother. He's doing the painting on the face of this sister here. I think that might have been a previous picture where I showed the dress. Here is another shirt uh, expired by the uh, coro people in the Omo Valley. Uh, he has the shoe, I mean, the, the mask and the hat painted in those same coro designs. The whole jumpsuit here, this sister flashing with the shoes. Now, uh, again, is um, if you want to get uh, Senzenga Jagna's uh, clothing line, which is the clothing of Jagna, his contact information. Uh, Contact clothing Jekna uh, for further information, designs, specification, uh, prices, and delivering. Email clothing Jekna at gmail at dot, uh, dot com. Phone call WhatsApp app uh, 447 3788. Hold on, 3788 That looks like a lot of numbers. Hold on, okay, 378. 896554. That do look like a lot of numbers, but that's the number that's on there. I think you have to download this WhatsApp in order to call to reach him because the brother is in London. And or you can Instagram him directly through a message on Instagram. His Instagram contact is the same cloth at Jekna if you want to purchase uh some of um uh his clothing. Here are my references here. I used a um, a quote by uh, my Masi Ara Kurin, uh, uh, Unc West, out of his uh, uh, out of his book, and I used some of his information for us the dating of the hominids and the homos, uh, the chron chronological of human evolution by Unc West. So if you ain't got that book, please get that book. It's a small little book, but it's jam packed with some powerful information. Uh, here are my rest of my things, but I just wanted to make sure that I, uh, you know, uh, shout out our, our brother Unc West's uh, book. So if you hadn't purchased his book, please go and purchase it. It is on his uh, it is on uh, Amazon.com as well as in his uh, uh, bookstore. I'll leave it up here for a minute so you can look. And again, I have no problem with you going through my sources, vending my sources for my information. I didn't want to make the presentation too long, but I wanted to share uh, some information on the Omo Valley uh, and the Caro uh, people, how artistic these people are in the uh, Omo Valley are, and as well put some shine on my brother's clothing line um, in, uh, uh, in London who was expired, his clothing line was expired by the Coro people. Um, I'll look in the chat and just, I'll look in the chat now, see if I got any questions. 
if anybody got any questions, I like I said, I was trying to get through with the presentation. Um, hope everybody enjoyed the presentation. If you liked the presentation, thumbs the video up. If you didn't like it, thumbs the video down. It don't make me no difference. Just do one or the other. Thumb it up or thumb it down. I ain't going to be mad one way or another. But if you like the video, it's easier for um, people to find the video. The more likes, easier for it to find. Uh, Sean, you know, if anybody got any questions, man, it's in the chat, man. I just, one thing just ran across my mind. I happened to glance at the chat and I seen, um, uh, when I mentioned about the, about the youth, how I, I was frowned upon to get, to have yes, a child. Uh, yes, is you know how it go, man. Anytime you mention something that's unfamiliar to them, uh, to the people, um, they, you know, take to the information a little bit differently. Um, whether we agree with the information or not, I mean, we could expect a reaction um, without knowing. We, we're supposed to know before we actually comment instead of comment and then find out why. Mm. But, um, I mean, I probably missed some because I was flipping back and forth. And, uh, you know, you answered mine, but I don't think directly we had anything pertaining to the bill, just some, you know, confusion about that. Um, I'm sorry, so you, you kind of did from there, man. But, um, you said you had a tree for the people, so that was a, the, the tree was at the end, right there, right? Yeah, uh, honey, it was uh, my brother clothing line. You know, if they was, you know, if yeah. they were liking the artwork on the bodies of the cultural people, you know, they, they can actually, you know, buy the outfits without painting their bodies in their faces. So the brother got masks, his head. Appreciate it, appreciate it. I'm looking now to see if anybody examples of my son. I've been spotting forces, kill the culture. Man, yeah, I can't, can't go too far up. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying. I can't either right now. I'm just looking. Man, to refresh, and when you refresh, it take away them, them top comments. Mm -hmm. So I can't see. I think uh, Sinead Lisa had some questions. She well, go ahead. She wanted, to, she wanted to ask you, but um, I can't see it. Uh, retype your question in, uh, send it, Lisa. What, what, what's, what's your question? Uh, brother, uh, uh, Lassa, uh, Gola. I, I know I'm saying your name wrong, and we done built a couple of times. Uh, Facebook, Facebook messenger and phone book. Peace to you, brother. That's a good brother there. Oh, um, she asked, do they still live in huts in places today? Overstand did. Do they still live in the same conditions that they did before? Yeah, they, 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 uh, those, I showed the pictures. Of, I mean, they not huts. I mean, they nice. They, they were, their homes were bigger than what they were. Matter of fact, I'll go back. I can show her the picture real quick. Uh, she's still on here. I'll show you what they looking like. They had two homes. You know, they had a home that they used when they was out cultivating after the flood. They, they used a certain home to uh, to grow their foods after the flood. And then after the after the harvest, I mean, I, I, after them doing certain things, then they will relocate back after they finish uh, doing what they did after the flood was to reap the benefits from the harvest that they had. They will move back further to their other homes. Hold on. Let me show here. They are right here. So you had like they had like the little small little entertainment like section things you would see like with these little small huts here and then you can see these here now they used to be bigger than this but they, they when they was rich in cattle but due to um a lot of the testner flies coming in it actually killed a lot of their cattle so uh they ended up uh you know not having as much wealth as they had and you know they ended up you know building these these home styles with what you know uh with what they had so here are the pictures right here. If she wanted to see exactly what the imageries of what they look like, I mean, it don't look too bad at all to me. You know, I know we look, we we used to the brick and mortar places, but and uh, uh, what's the name? He he mentioned uh the fly uh the uh the far as I know um brother brother Gullah, I'm gonna say Gullah because I don't want to uh. Mispronounce your name, like I said, that's a good brother. We done built 
uh, uh, one time on the phone and we done built a few times over the uh, Facebook message. He actually sent me some information, some information that I didn't know dealing with the girl that uh, I'm going to put into uh, my work. But um, they uh the, the red feather, the white feather and the black feather. I, I couldn't find any significance on why those they wore those different colors. Now, um, I see more of the elders with the uh, black, the black. Well, no, no, no. I see a lot of the elders with the white feathers and I see a lot of the warriors, the quarter warriors with the black feathers on. And I couldn't find really no pictures of the red cloth on. I seen the closest I came was a picture I showed uh, with a brother. It was like a yellowish reddish. Uh, this this here on this uh, slide here, if y'all if y'all can still see my uh, my slide still going here with this this uh, this uh, this elder. This I'm I'm assuming he's an elder here. Uh, he has black and this reddish and this yellow looking feather. So I don't know specifically what the colors are. I'd be lying to you and tell you. I'm just saying from just observation. From the observation I'm seeing, I, I see a lot of the elders with the white feathers. And I see a lot of the coral warriors uh, with the black feathers on. And I'm not real familiar with the red. But I could be wrong with all three of them. So I'm being honest right there. I don't know. Uh for sure. But if, like I said, you go look through uh, the pictures and some of the other things, you can see a lot of the warriors with the black feathers and the elders with the white feathers. Um, and saying that, Lisa, I didn't jump. Um, I hope you, I, I, I didn't jump you. I'm, all I'm saying is that we, uh, every week, we put out information and a lot of it is dealing with our traditions and our culture. And we put references and we put our sources. We, we put all those things, the journals, the articles um, and the books. We put those things out there. We pause it for you all to go and look to vent our sources to do your own due diligence of research. But we keep talking about our tradition because we try to educate our people and what's going on in Africa. They're specifically dealing with our culture and our tradition because we have no sense of what's going on over there or with our culture and our traditions. So we're continuing to uh, reiterate these things, but it's people, when we come back to a same type of topic, you know, cause I understand a lot of us being indoctrinated, you know what I'm saying? So when certain words that we hear are cold words, like if I say the devil, that's a cold word. We go to thinking about a mytholo mythological character buried way down in the ground with what's the name, you know, with, uh, with, uh, up with horns and a tail and so forth. So when we mention certain words, I understand it's cold words that go off and we think of certain things because we've been educated a certain way over here. That's why we're trying to get you familiar with African culture. And again, with what we put out, we're not biased. We're not cherry picking the information. So even if I disagree with certain things that go on, I'm still going to put the information out there. You know what I'm saying? But then when you do research, that's why I said there are similar, there are small numbers in what they did, you know, for as killing the babies that are born out of wedlock. And if you've been following us and anybody else been following us and under, or even if you just been studying African cultures uh, in West Africa, uh, South Africa, Central, uh, Central Africa, West Africa, you will always come across. Their spiritual systems are based around white surpasses. They are based around a creator or a supreme being. They're based around Lord, Lord deities. They are based around pouring libations. They are based around ancestor uh, venerations and so forth. So we've been talking about these things. So some of these things shouldn't be new. So when I say that, you ought to say, OK, well, they practice these certain things. But I know with white surpasses, it must be. Let me look and see. Was it a small number? Uh, of this going on, uh, or how I understand it was founded upon because when you deal with the rights of passages, the rights of passages is connected to the marriage right. The marriage right is the most purpose. The women save themselves, they are taught through the adults' rights of passages as well as the men to be virgins until they get married and to build nations by bonding different families together or different families coming together and being married together and building nations, clans, wealth, and so forth. So I just get frustrated when we talk about the same things or we talk and then the same people 
say the same thing like this is new information and we've been talking about it forever so you know and it's just it's not i'm not picking on you this anybody if for now on when we do presentations please take out a pen and a piece of paper write it down and then write down or go back to the video in the archives write the sources down the journals the articles the books and go back and do your own research you know but again i wasn't picking on you uh senate lisa anybody else got any questions before we get up out of here you got something you finna say something sin nah she was she was saying i was jumping on her when she made a comment i said she don't realize that that the comment she makes the comment often when we when we speak of things that um you know that are unfamiliar to everyone else and uh that you know disagree with we can't be biased and we have to put forth the information um that is why when we do the research we got to show both sides of the argument the for and the against because if we don't show the for and the against then it defeats the purpose so right. as much as we show the pretty side of the presentation we got to show the ugly too because within inside of that culture um you know the ideals of that it just goes from there right but now nah, man i i really ain't got nothing else man unless you want me to talk about next week yeah, yeah, you know, I'm, I ain't gonna hold the mic, man. Uh, yeah, talk about next week, and I, uh, huh? I say you do, you be hogging the mic. <laughs> Go ahead, though, man. Go ahead. I'm gonna share my screen real quick. Okay, let me uh take it off my screen real quick, and I'll come back before I get off. Uh, hold on, cause I know. Ooh, I'm finna mess up. Go ahead. You was about to end the show. I'm finna mess up. Yeah, yep. Yeah. <laughs> nah, nah. Good, Go ahead. I'm making mess Good presentation, Go by the way, bro. Uh, but uh, in 2016, I actually had posted a uh, link about the uh, about the canvases of, uh, of the car roll and so forth over there. And, uh, you know, dealing with the Omo Valley. So when you start getting into it and, and going on about the bill, you know, I already had had uh, was familiar with a lot of the things that you actually mentioned. But um, when you when you posted the pictures of the guns, the brothers with the guns, you remember that book that I put in my back chat about the uh, the guns in Central Africa. Mm hmm. Yeah. See, in, the, in that book, um, the, the author of that book actually did primary research in the area as well. And uh, he found out through his research that a lot of a lot of the tribes were associating the AK-47s as a sense of manhood and power and control. You know what I'm saying? So uh, they gave them that sense of power, I guess. But for people looking on my screen, I don't know. I shouldn't say I don't know. My ultimate goal was to drop this owners of the door prosperity um, next week. But then I was thinking that this this one here tomorrow's the floating tombs i was thinking about doing that but um i have both of them done but i i do think that i'm going to come with the uh come with this one next week because i think people should uh understand what this one is about this is cultural it's dealing with something in west africa for people who are unfamiliar if anyone don't know who the figures are in the image we're going to deal with that. It's our job to present the information for you. But when I get to this one right here, uh, this one right here is going to mess with some minds because uh, um, I got some primaries dealing with this man that come out of the, uh, I don't want to tell them where they come out of yet. I'm going to say it in the presentation, but um, it's, it's some information right under people's noses. But, um, you know, I'm looking forward to bringing it, man. You did. A, this was this was a good bill. This was a really good bill. And uh, hopefully people will go back and rewatch this and um, and just deal with the information and, and take away take away the good things from it and uh, put the bad things into perspective. And what you you know, what you don't like about the bad things, go back and try to find out the why in that and, and, and uh, 
don't justify it because I'm not going to ever tell anyone to justify something that they disagree with. But kind of just learn from the experience. But that's it, man. I mean, power job, bro. You uh, you didn't go too long. You know what I mean? You was cool, actually. Yeah, I wasn't trying to go too long, man. Um, uh, so be uh, stay on, be on the lookout for um, uh, seeing Sean presentation. Um, I'm looking bad. I'm tired, y'all. Um, I don't care. How I'm looking right now. I'm tired. Um, I appreciate everybody for tuning in, watching the show again. Like, it takes a lot of work, a lot of research, a lot of hours, a lot of money to uh, do these um, things. And um, so, just we're gonna, like I said, we're gonna continue to beat y'all in the head with these presentations. Uh, so, be on the lookout for his presentation. I got two already locked and loaded, two. That's why I'm really tired and I'm finna take a break, just trying to get uh, these things out the way. Um, so uh, after Sean, I have something. I posted something um, dealing with the Karabibi uh, people, if I'm pronouncing the name right. And um, it's actually going to be talking about are we exhibiting good character? I did a presentation on good character, but this is going to be specifically on us greeting each other. Hey, do sensitive we, to link. Huh? Go ahead, do it now. Sensitive to link. Can you do it for me? Yeah, I, I got it. Okay. But yeah, it's, it's dealing with do we walk past people and uh like we we uh like they don't exist or do we ignore their being? You know, being means to exist. So I'll be talking about the greetings with the Karabibi people. So I'll be going in depth with that, but trying to connect it to are we practicing good character and what we call an ifa uh uh, EY Pele. So be on the lookout for that presentation, which will be after San Sean presentation, and then San Sean will come back, and then I got another one that's locked and loaded. I just have to finish. I think I got a few slides to do. Um, it's called um, um, uh, Tanzania and Mozambique uh, Makandi people. So we'll be talking about the uh, people in uh, uh, Mozambique which is in East Africa and Tanzania and East uh, East Africa. So I'll be showing a lot of pictures um, and a lot of things that's dealing with them as far as their artistic style, as far as um, carving. That's how they make their money is through carving. And they were one of the groups that resisted, which um, I posted something about the Magi, Magi Wars. Uh, with the group of Africans coming together. These uh, Makandi people was also involved in that, but we'll talk about that and how they ended up in Mozambique and Tanzania uh, on these uh, platforms. I mean, on the, uh, on, the, on the plateaus in Mozambique and in Tanzania. So, and then he'll come back and with his twins, present twi twi twins presentation. So we appreciate y'all. Um, we appreciate the support. Um, we appreciate it. I wanted to ask a question though. I don't know if it was live or not, but he got the link. Yeah, come on in, Sotel, before we get up off here. We're gonna jump off in uh in just a second. But again, I just want to say we, we appreciate everybody. We ask that y'all continue to support us and continue to tell people uh about uh about the channel. You know, don't only come on the channel and look at the video, but if you come on the channel, please subscribe. Please subscribe uh and hit the bell. You know, we uh we're gonna continue to kill y'all with these uh these presentations. We're gonna continue to um give y'all an understanding of um your African culture, your African lineage, uh whether you like it uh or not. <laughs> and I know a lot of people is not gonna like it, um, but they just gonna have to get over it. Um come on, Satep, if you're gonna come in here real quick. At I'm about to end the show. Okay, okay then. Well, all right then. I want to just say, uh, do I, do I, ooh, uh, and um, we'll check you out the next time. Appreciate again, y'all, for tuning in. Hold on, hold on. Let me go back. Let me go back. I want to share my screen real quick because I, I won't, I, I forgot to do this. Hold on. 
Dang, I can't even show on that. All right, share screen. Uh, everybody. I'm sorry. All right. Let me go. I just forgot to do this. I already talked about it, but I didn't talk about the other two. Real quick. Yeah, about 60 some slides. A lot of them was pitched. Okay. Um, please go and subscribe to the session my Ani Metanetra group, which I am also a member of. We are a group of like minded individuals where we uh, study the language, which is the Rani Kemet, and the writing script, which is called the Sesh Metanetra, or what y'all call the hieroglyphs. Uh, so please go and subscribe to that channel. We have a lot of content. Uh, on our channel that's dealing with the language and the writing. So please go and subscribe. And if um, you are interested in learning the session metanetter, you can email, uh, uh, not email me, but you can uh, inbox me or you can inbox any of Red Sean Cal Funny, or you can go to the website. Uh, uh, it's session it's uh, it's com. I think that's right, uh, Sean Sean. Yeah, I think it's sessionmetanetter.com uh, if you're interested in um, uh, learning a language. Yep, you're right. Also, please go subscribe. Please go subscribe to my personal channel, Kofi Paisa TV. I haven't been doing a lot of stuff on there lately. I've been focusing on more with the Mossy uh, Warrior Clan, but some of the videos I do uh, download on my channel as well but please go support my channel i have a lot of information on there again it's my channel is uh to take the black man black woman and black uh child eurocentric mind and africanize it most about anything you want to learn about african culture is on kofi paisa tv so please go and subscribe to it you know it's the it's the african netflix so if you ain't doing nothing on the weekends and you just want to African Netflix and chill with your kids or your children where y'all can all get together, cook, eat, you know what I'm saying, have some fun and learn at the same time. Please subscribe to Kofi Paisa TV. Uh, please. Uh, also subscribe to the Master Warrior Clan. As I said earlier, please subscribe to our channel. We appreciate y'all for tuning in. We appreciate y'all for the big influx. Uh, I mean, the big increase. Uh, on the subscribers, we ask that you continue to subscribe. We ask that you tell a friend to tell a friend to tell a friend to tell a friend about all these great channels that we got going on. Uh, and uh, again, we appreciate it. Modupe and Moriwi, we out.